It's Friday, 12 o'clock. Welcome to the Maritime Innovation Update. Today, my colleague, Julius Küchle from the group Ports and Transport Markets here at the Fraunhofer Merit Center for Maritime Logistics will be talking about value creation through peak shaving. I would like to remind you that this MIU is being recorded, so please leave your cameras and microphones switched off. And one last announcement before we start with the presentation. Uh, questions can be asked in the chat and will be answered by Mr. Küchle at the end of his presentation. That being said, I hand over to you, Julius. Thank you, Alex, for your very kind introductory words. Um, so let's dive right into it. Um, value creation creation through peak shaving. Uh, here we go. Um, so let's start with a bit of a definition. What is peak shaving? Um, basically, what we see here is a load curve. And as the name suggests, we have a peak load at the very top of that curve. This means this is the highest load that we um, record over the given time frame. Um, now, what is peak shaving? Peak shaving is therefore a method of load management. Um, why is that important? Why do we do it? First of all, in our national energy grids, supply has to meet demand at any point of time. This means that um, any energy provider will have to adjust their production always based on the momentary demand in the grid. Um, since this can be very difficult to do and especially cost intensive to do for irregular load curves in the grid, um, they incentivize the um, companies and industrial consumers to have less irregular loads by um, having introduced a fee that is based on the highest load recorded in a billing cycle. Um, and they call it this, uh, they call this a network usage fee or the grid usage fee. And it's basically a multiplication of a fixed amount with the peak load. And this is uh, constant for the whole billing period and can comprise up to 30% of your energy bill. Um, so this is also how we basically create value in this context. We by saving these costs. Um, so what is the goal of peak shaving? The, peak, uh, the goal is to reduce costs. How do we do this? How do we handle a peak load? We took the liberty of dividing these uh, the approaches into two broad categories, uh, reactive and proactive approaches, um, meaning that in a reactive um, approach, we basically wait for the load to happen, the peak to happen, and then react to that. We can do that by either covering the extra demand with some form of extra production of energy, um, or we can use stored energy in some whatever sense we have it. Um, and on the other hand, we have proactive approaches. These are these can be fixed proactive approaches. I can I can shift my load in a time or schedule my shift very uh, in a fixed way, or I can um, do something that we call dynamic load scheduling, um, where we dynamically shift our loads or shift our production. Um, or operations in a way that we avoid loads altogether, um, peaks as best as we can. Um, so just to illustrate that really quick, um, we see our load curve from the beginnings and, and then we would like to basically shave off the upper peak area um, by moving the processes that, um, that are uh, that, that basically lead to this peak and move them into a valley, into an area where there's less energy demand scheduled or predicted or expected. Um, so let's start with the reactive technologies. And here we start with Pika plants. This is really from the view of an energy provider usually. So whenever there's a load that the grid has to manage, a peak that the grid has to manage, they will use um, Pika plants, so-called Pika plants. They can be they're usually open cycle power plants or hydroelectric power plants, um, which are very expensive to build and of course to operate. Um, also loads of them, ex with the exception of the hydroelectric power plants, obviously are gas turbine based. So in terms of the ecological impact, that's um, also not quite the best way of doing it. Um, so this is how the how the grid basically or the energy provider can react to such a uh, such a peak. But um, on the other hand, what can a company do? They can either, if they want to be reactive, um, use energy storage systems, meaning that um, they will buy some sort of a big battery that gets charged over time and they'll then cover the peak um, with a few drawbacks in, of, in and of itself. First of all, um, batteries are quite energy intensive um, to produce. Rare earths are in there um, as well. So 
the ecological amortization is questionable. Let's just phrase it like that. Um, and then another drawback is that once your energy storage has run out, you are defenseless, basically. So um, if you have a, lo a lot of unforeseen demands or a very, very regular load schedule, um, you need to plan very, very carefully with, um, with an energy storage system in order to, to, to have a high chance of catching all the loads that you want to catch. Um, then, of course, there are hybrid approaches. Um, usually, there is some form of a and, uh, or some form of renewable energy production on site, either, be it either through photovoltaic or wind turbines, um, and you use that to cover some portion of your regular demand and whatever excess you produce, um, you basically store in an ESS and can then tap into this stored energy whenever unforeseen peaks uh, should occur. So basically you set a threshold and say whenever our load goes above that, we will use the energy used in our ESS with obviously the same drawbacks as the ESS itself has. Um, and the additional minor issue, but it's still an issue that we should be talking about, that a lot of these uh, energy productions that uh, people do on site, be it wind or photovoltaic, are weather dependent. You can't exactly turn off the sun or anything. Um, so if there's no sunshine, you, you basically run into uh, the same issue as before, that your ESS just doesn't get charged and you are defenseless uh, yeah, against these uh, peaks. Um, a bit of background here, the energy mix in Germany is changing quite drastically and will change even more drastically over the next years. Um, and what I want to focus on here is that the um, the share of renewables and especially weather dependent renewables is rising constantly. Um, and as I just mentioned, you can't just get a uh, get produce more energy if your energy production is weather based because you don't have control over the weather. Um, meaning that purely reactive um, yeah strategies to, to to work with peaks will not be feasible or will be very expensive in the future. Um, this means we need to move away from reactive approaches to proactive approaches, meaning we want to avoid the, the, the load altogether or reduce the, the, the reasons for these loads. And how do we do this? Either through demand management, so the aforementioned production scheduling. Um, this is what we illustrated earlier with valley filling or load delay, basically. And it, this works really well for, for very um, consistent productions uh, or operations where you do not have any too unforeseen things. Um, and if you can schedule there carefully, you can have very regular loads and uh, avoid the issue altogether. But since uh, the reality is often much more complicated, uh, dynamic load scheduling has its uh, place to shine, so to speak, because if you cannot foresee um, how, your, how your operations are, especially if you're, for example, in a sort of service environment as you would be in a port, um, then dynamic load scheduling um, is way more important. So you need to, uh, and the idea is that you predict or forecast your load patterns in a, in a rather short time frame for the next half an hour or an hour even. Um, and based on that, you make a decision on how to adjust your, your energy consumption in order to avoid um, using more energy than, than whatever threshold you seem um, reasonable. This is currently used in, in, in loads of different systems. Uh, greenhouse control is, is, a, is a very popular example. Vehicle to grid um, ideas are, um, are using such an uh, are using such approaches as well. Hydropower systems, smart grids, and of course internet data centers. Um, they all forecast their load patterns and then try to yeah adjust the the processes in the background um, accordingly. Where do we see potentials and ports? Um, there are three main areas. Of course, there's more than that, but those are the three most promising areas in ports. Um, this is, first of all, STS uh, cranes or cranes in, in general, um, they, which usually consume the biggest amounts of energy when they are being started up. So just um, by looking at when a, a crane is used and um, trying to start them up asynchronously can already help to avoid quite the tremendous peaks. Then um, we have bike terminals in general. They have lots of feeder belts and conveyor belts and um, heavy lifting operations as well. Um, usually there's some form of value added production in the background in the silos where um, stuff gets uh, yeah, seized, received, for example. Um, so 
those are loads of different difficult pro uh, processes that are highly irregular because chips they they come and expect to be served immediately. Um, this is very difficult to to do on your own, and they are uh, forecasting energy demands based on on AIS data and the really like uh, recorded ro uh, historic data um, can give you the edge you need to to get these forecasts ready to then adjust your processes dynamically. And then in reefer containers, this is basically um, very similar idea. Uh, reefer containers, if they all start their cooling processes at the very same time, um, you run into quite a tremendous loads. Uh, and just by um, looking at the data that these 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 reefers readily already transmit, um, those can be synchronized better, and then uh, you avoid the big load peaks. So what are the key takeaways here? Um, we have peak loads. Peak loads can constitute up to 30% of your energy costs, um, and they can be reduced through load management. Um, how can we shave those peaks? Uh, either through re reactive measures, meaning picker plants, ESS systems, hybrid solutions of the two. Um, the drawbacks are usually in the construction costs uh, here and in the, in the amortization, ecological amortization especially. Um, there are proactive solutions as well. The proactive solutions usually um, employ some sort of scheduling of, of operations. Um, in the best case, it's dynamic scheduling. Drawbacks here are that we really are dependent on a high forecasting accuracy. And of course, that we need to be able to change our operations dynamically whenever it is needed. Um, where do we see the biggest areas of application? As just as I just mentioned, those are usually in lifting processes um, uh, with reefers or in um, yeah, silos of bulk terminals and bulk terminals in general. Um, we are currently doing a project um, in this regard as well. It's called Dashport um, with the subtitle Digital Control Center for Analyzing and Controlling Energy Flows in Ports. And we do that with our project partners, Niedersachsen Ports GmbH, uh, Jürgmüller AG, and the Office Institute of Computer Science in Oldenburg. Um, the project is, ha, has a volume of 1.1 million euros funded by the BMDV's uh, Innovative Port Technologies Funding Program, IHATEC. Um, here, we basically look at the um, bulk port of Brake as a whole, the terminal of Lepmüller, uh, and try to holistically um, predict their loads, predict the processes, and then um, go from there to employ some form of dynamic load scheduling. And I think this was it. I'm now looking forward to your questions. Yes, thank you, Julius, for this interesting presentation. Uh, we now, as you said, have time for your questions. Uh, you can either write them in the chat or simply unmute your microphone and ask them directly. I don't see any questions in the chat, and if that's the case, I cannot hear anyone. So I've got a small question for you. Um, you mentioned the proactive approach <clears throat> in Dashboard. How exactly do you create the high forecasting accuracy, which you mentioned is important in terms of dynamic load scheduling? Um, yeah, okay. And in, in the context of dashboard, we employed or deployed about 500 smart meters. And um, uh, the, I'm, I'm not sure of the English acronym, but uh, SPS systems, which are basically uh, small computers that all have had already been deployed in the, in the whole silo of Jörg Miller. Um, and we use this data we, that we recorded there for about a year um, to feed into a um, yeah, AI-based algorithm, uh, machine learning approach, basically, um, that looks for the patterns in load. We enrich this data with AIS data of ships arriving. Um, we even looked at uh, we even looked at the distribution of truck arrivals as well. And um, by using all these data points and connecting them in this machine learning model, we can predict loads for the next half an hour rather accurately um, to an hour. And uh, based on that, we then use a um, categorization of each consumer where we basically um, decided how much we can postpone the consumer or if we can use this consumer in, in, in a lower intensity, for example, like we would but like we would sometimes be able to do it with light. Um, and then 
and based on that, we, we come up with actions, uh, recommendations for actions um, that are presented to the to the operative um, work, yeah, the operative department basically in the port, and they can then uh, dynamically decide which of these recommendations for actions they can um, actually deploy in, in the most meaningful way, and then avoid loads in uh, yeah avoid loads in that way. Okay, thank you. If uh, nobody has any questions left, as it seems, um, I would like to kindly remind you of the next MIU, next Friday at 12 o'clock, uh, where our colleague Paul Koch will give a talk about the topic V0 object annotation for situal awareness of autonomous navigation. I think we have a slide for that as well with contact. Ah, yeah, there it is. All right. Thanks a lot for joining and uh, have a good weekend. Goodbye.